today. I want to get into this. Starting this new series today called Salt Life. Salt Life has become one of my favorite brands of all time. If you don't know anything about Salt Life, it's Salt Life is a brand. It is a uh, it is a brand for the for ocean people. It's a they they got surfer guys and they got fishermen and and all everything that has to do with ocean and the ocean life and everything that's involved in that. That's what Salt Life is. It's a brand of people that, that love the ocean. And, and so I went back and I was looking at Salt Life because they have the coolest stuff. They have the coolest shirts and stickers. And so I, I am a Salt Life wannabe guy. I, I love that stuff. And so I've gone back and I was looking at where Salt Life originated and what it was all about. And, and I used that idea to, to develop this series that I'm starting today. Salt Life started from four guys that, that were beach guys, that these four guys in Florida that were just together, and, and they were talking about all the things that they loved that the ocean provided for them. And so they came up with an idea. The idea was the plan. And then they developed the idea, and the idea became a brand. And it became a brand that was, that was known, became known by a lot of people. And what's happened is they took this idea from an idea, from the plan, to a brand. And then people have taken the brand, and they have done great things with it. it it's become much bigger than what any of these four guys originally thought would happen. And so I was thinking about salt life and I was thinking about the, the fishing side of it especially and, and I took it back to what Jesus, how he worked. I think Jesus would have been a lot like these four guys that started salt life. He, he loved the ocean. He loved the sea. He loved the things that had to do with it. And he was an idea guy. But he was an idea guy that never intended for his, for his idea, the things that he started with, to stay there. He fully intended to brand his ideas and to hand it to us and to see what we would do with it. I think Jesus probably would have hung out with these, with these guys. And I want to tell you, going into this series, I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll explain more what I'm going to be specifically talking about in this series, but ultimately it comes down to this. It comes down to the church. Jesus had an idea, and he handed it to some people, and it became this brand. And what we do with the brand, it's the, the, the brand and the understanding of what Jesus' original idea has been handed to the church. And I just want to say, I, I want you to understand, I think the church has done a really bad job of, of maintaining the trueness of the idea. So somewhere along the lines, the brand has lost a little bit of what the original idea was meant to be. And so if you're here and you hear me, uh, if you've spent much time here and you hear me talking about the church very much, I, w I want you to not be confused. I'm not against it. I'm for it. I just struggle with what we have done with it. Because I want to say to you this. I believe this wholeheartedly. I don't believe this was Jesus' idea for the church. I think it's much bigger than this. And so I want to, I want to take you back and I want to look at some of this stuff. Some of these things. The idea, the plan. And the brand, how it gets lived out. Because I, again, I think it's very safe to say that, that this is not his plan. And I would say that because if you, if you know much, it seems like the more you get involved in the church, the more you find out, and the more you see the, the fighting and the struggles and, the, and all the mess. That's not God's plan. The churches ought to be the most, the churches ought to run to each other. 
Instead of what we've done is we have decided, we have, we've drawn these lines in the sand and we've said, well, I believe this, I believe this, but what about Jesus? He's a, he ought to be the, the drawing thing that draws together and the church ought to be the most welcoming place in the world. And the church doesn't even welcome the church very much, much less the world. And that's a terrible thing that we've done with his brand. And so where, where, where did all that happen? Where do we get so confused? Well, first, I want us to go back and look at the idea of a plan. In life, I want you to understand this. In life, I'm going to be talking about life a lot, but I want you to understand, I'm talking about the lives that we live with the brand, the, the thing that God gave us, the thing that Jesus set up originally, and what he's done with it is hand it to you. So when I talk about life, I'm talking about what life looks like with your faith involved in it. That's what I'm talking about. So when we look at life, I want to say this to you. As far as your faith goes and fitting into your life, I want to say if you don't have a plan, you have a plan. Benjamin Franklin said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. I don't think there's a more appropriate statement. When it comes to your faith and taking your faith into your life and your faith being an actual motivating, an actual defining way that you live life, I want to say to you, if you don't have a plan for how to use your faith in your life, you have a plan. It's just like Benjamin Franklin said. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. And so, I, I know that sounds a little bit harsh, but, but when we look at Jesus' plan, I think that I think that when we look at the, the plan that Jesus set in place, which is what we're about to do, I, I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's a struggle for us to, to grasp what I was saying. Whenever I said this isn't it, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm not hammering the church. I'm for the church, but I'm, I'm saying the church needs to go back and look at what his original plan was. And we need to say, how am I doing? With my part of his plan, how am I carrying the brand? How am I, how, am I, how am I walking this out? What does it look like? So we have to go back and look at Jesus' plan first place. Matthew chapter 4. This is where Jesus was, was defining the idea. And it, so it starts out at this idea, and this is where he hands these first guys, the brand, and this is what we're still supposed to be carrying. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He, li he liked it. I think he loved to hang out around the water. And it said he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them and Im immediately they left their boat and they followed, they left their boat and their father and they followed him. What I'm wondering is if maybe we got to this state and we think that this is what it's about, I'm wondering if maybe, maybe we're flawed in our premise. These guys left everything that they knew and had because of an encounter with Jesus. And I'm wondering if you've ever had a real encounter with Jesus. If you've ever had such a real encounter with him that, that it stirred you so much that maybe you would be willing to leave everything that you've known. 
And the crazy part is, this wasn't an encounter with him. It's not that they saw him do a miracle. It's not that, they, it's not that he walked up to him on the water. We know he can, but he wasn't, he wasn't walking on water. He wasn't, you know, calling down fire. He wasn't, he wasn't feeding thousands of people with a little bit of food. He was just walking. But something about him was so drawing to them. That it made them be willing to leave everything. And he took these fishermen. And and the idea then that he presented to them was this. Follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. So he was speaking to who they were. He was meeting them at this place. These fishermen. And he was presenting to them this idea of becoming fishers of men. And so here's what I think. Here's where I think the problem is. It's not that all of us aren't willing to fish. I'm just afraid that many of us though are fishing with no bait. Man. If we're fishing with no bait or maybe we're not even fishing with the right bait. So here's what that looks like. If you want to understand this whole concept that Jesus was laying out that we're supposed to be walking in, then we have to understand fishing. So there's two things that have to happen to understand fishing. First, you got to know the kind of fish that you're fishing for. And then you have to know what the right bait is. Because if you're fishing for a certain kind of fish and you're either using no bait or the wrong bait, you're never going to catch that fish. So, fishing, as you all know from the last, if you've been here very long, fishing is something that I like to do. And I understand fishing. And I understand things about fishing. This is a, this is a, this is called a spin cast reel. This reel, you, in order to use this reel, you got to flip this lever over and, and then you, you let go of the string and, and, and it's, there's nothing to it. You flop it back and, and you reel it in. And so if you're, if you're fishing, this is a great rod and reel to, to fish with. If you're, if you're just going to cast it out and put, put a weight on it and let it sit. And, and if you're catfishing or something like that, it's a, great, it's a great rod and reel for something like that. It's a great rod and reel to go bass fishing with. It's, it's, I understand how you, how you use this rod and reel. This is a pretty simple rod and reel to use. I understand the different things that you do with it. This, it's all right if it falls, it's already broken. This is a even simpler rod and reel. This is the kind of rod and reel you use when you're taking your kid fishing. Because if you've ever fished with a kid, you know they're going to mess it up. They're going to have string everywhere. This one, man, this is a simple one. You just push the button, you let it go, and ooh, you catch a little communion. <laughs> There's nothing to this one. You just push the button and reel it. It's a, it's a simple thing. Nobody has a hard time with these type of rod and reels. Everybody can use this. You, this, this is cake. This is, a, this is a, a great rod and reel to use to take a kid fishing with or, you know, to do any kind of fishing. It's good. Now, this is a different machine. This, nobody gets to touch this because you got to know what you're doing to use this. This is a... This is a bait casting rod and reel. And this rod and reel, you can mess up quick. When you cast this rod and reel, I'm going to try to not hit anybody. You got you to gotta hold the line because if you don't, then it's going to keep spinning and it will get backlash in it. And if it gets backlash in it, I mean, that little, that little cast that I did right there. Look, I'm pulling out all this backlash. I just messed this thing up crazy. And if you hand this rod and reel to a kid and you let them try to cast it one time, they, they're going to cast it one, maybe two times. They're going to hand it back to you. It's going to look like a bird's nest and it is worthless at that point. There is, there is nothing else that you can do with it. Because when you cast this, you have to understand. You have to understand how to use it. And so this is a this is my preferred rod and reel to use if I'm going to take it and do a little bass fishing. T- 
take it and, you know, you got, you, if you're going to be a bass fisherman, you got to learn the difference between a, a crankbait and a spinnerbait and a, and a, and a topwater lure. And you got to understand if you're fishing topwater and, and you're going to be fishing where there's a lot of stuff, you got to know the kind of lures that can walk on the, cr- on the top of the moss or, or if you've got some good reeds and, and you know those bass are laying down on those reeds, this is a great kind of rod and reel to do my favorite kind of fish and you put a worm or a lizard on the end of it and that's my favorite because when you cast that out and you're fishing with the worm the way that works you let that thing sink and then you then's when the fun starts then you you let it sink down to the bottom and then you work it along the bottom and then you reel it in and you're waiting for that time when as you're working it you feel that little bump, bump, bump. and when you do you stop you watch the line, and when everything works right, you see that line start taking off. That's when you set the hook, and all of a sudden, the fight is on. Bass fishing, it's my favorite thing to do. I was thinking about all this stuff when it comes to this verse. And I think about these things, and I think about fishing and using the right bait. And, and even the passage, I think about this rod and reel a lot. When that passage in 1 first, in first Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast your cares onto the Lord because he cares for you. And I wonder if maybe we're not, we're not understanding the brand. If maybe we're not walking out our faith right. And maybe we don't even understand what that means. Because depression affects us and, and doubt and worry and fear. All of these things affect us. And all of these things the scripture tells us has no authority and no right to affect us. But it does. So I wonder if maybe we don't understand how to cast. I wonder if maybe the problem is not so much. I think a lot of times we go, God, where are you? Why did you? And I think maybe, maybe it's like a kid that tries to cast with this. And we don't even understand what it means to cast our cares onto him. Because I wonder if it has to do with the next part of that verse which says, Casting our cares onto Christ because he cares for us. I wonder if maybe that's what James and John and and Peter and Andrew, if that's the reason they were willing to leave everything. Because at one look, with just one look, Jesus was able to communicate to them, you can trust me. You can truly cast your cares onto me. And if you could understand that he cares about the rent, that he cares about the difficulties in marriage, that he cares about our kids, jobs, houses, groceries. I wonder if we started really understanding that he cared about those, if we would learn a new way to even be able to cast those things onto him. I think the reason we don't cast our cares onto him is because I think we have the same problem that I was talking about in the church. I think we still don't understand Jesus. I think we don't know how to cast our cares onto him because I think most of us don't really understand that he really does care for us. And so that may be the thing that I think takes us back to this place. So all of that I'm saying And this whole idea, this whole salt life idea, man, live the life, salt life. That's what the brand says. Live the life. I wonder how many of us, if we were being real, are living the life. And if you take it back to this verse in in Matthew where he's talking to these guys, these fishermen, and he said, hey, I want to make you fishers of men. I don't think we know what that means. I don't think the church knows what that means. So what does that mean? Well, you have to go from that passage in, in Matthew to back farther on in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, to finish understanding really what that means. Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You see what he's starting with? He's starting with him. I don't think we believe that all authority in heaven and on earth rests in Jesus. Can I stand in front of you and be bold enough to say, I don't think you believe that. 
I don't think I believe that. If I did, I wonder if I would stay as jacked up about the state of wherever we are. I'm always worrying about the church or my family or whatever. I think it's right for you to stand there and sit in front of me and say, but you always talk about this vision that you believe the Lord has for this church. So if you believe that there, the Lord has a vision for this church, why are you so concerned about the state of the church all the time? Either you believe he has a vision for it or you don't. And if he has a vision for it, Will he accomplish what he says? That's what we have to figure out. So this passage and this whole idea of fishermen being a fisher of men, you got to go back to this passage and you got to understand at the beginning that Jesus is the one that has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been given to him. And then he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all of the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, teaching them. Go, he, he tells us to, to, to trust him, and then he sends us into the whole world. He sends us out, make disciples of the nations, baptize them, and teach them. And somewhere along the line, we've messed up. We've messed, we've, we've messed that whole thing up. Let me prove it to you. Make disciples. What's the goal of most churches? How many people did y'all see saved? Which is a good goal. But that's only one part of it. Make disciples. That means you have to introduce, if I'm going to, to take two people and I'm going to make this person a disciple of this person, my first obligation is to introduce them to each other. This person can never follow this person if they don't know who he is. And I am supposed to be the representative of him so that when they look at me, they're supposed to want what I've got, this relationship with him. Make disciples. I, I say this with love, but I want to say this. I wonder if maybe the state of the church gets to a place where everybody frets and everybody worries. And I wonder if maybe you fret and you worry about the state of things a little bit too. Because you're wondering when I'm going to pull a rabbit out of my hat and make things work or whatever. But I wonder if maybe we're looking at it backwards. Who did he call to make disciples? Me and you. So I say this with love. But have you discipled anybody in your life? Have you ever led anyone to the Lord? I didn't know it was going to be like that today. I thought we were going to talk about fishing, man. I promise you, I'm never going to catch a fish if I leave my son's ring on this. If I want to catch a fish, though, I'm going to have to put some bait on the end of this line. And then I'm going to have to take it to a lake that has fish in it. And then I'm going to have to cast it. So I wonder, I wonder if there's even any fishermen. And maybe, maybe we're not fishing because maybe we don't even really understand who he is. I think about the stuff that we, <laughs> we deal with. Man, people getting mad at each other and fighting over this and that and me getting mad. And I wonder if Jesus is looking at us going, man, you're missing the whole point. And I want to let you not off the hook, but I want to ask you to scoot over and share the hook with me. When's the last time I personally have led someone to the Lord? 
that I've said, hey, bro, my name's Mark. How's things? Yeah, good. Man, how, how are you in Jesus? Do you know him? I'm not talking about being religious and going out and down the street with the bullhorn and whacking people over the head with the Bible. Man, I, those people, bless them. That's, I'm not, I don't have no stones to throw, but I don't think that's, I think it's more about people seeing the life that you live and going, I need what you've got. And I wonder if nobody is interested. I wonder if maybe the problem is nobody's interested in having what we've got. I wonder if, if we look as broken as the rest of the world looks, maybe that's the problem. So I'm just, I'm just starting this series out. I got all this. I got way better stuff. Come back for part two. But I can't get to it because I wonder, I wonder if anybody's even fishing. I used to catch a lot of fish. I used to. I haven't done that in a really long time. And do you know why? It's not that I forgot how. I haven't gone fishing. I got to go to the lake or I'm never going to catch a fish. Have you? When it comes to your faith, it's not, a play, it's not about bringing a place of condemnation. But here's, here's the thing, because this is where I want to take you back to. I want to take you to that on purpose. I want to walk you through that, but I want to take you to this. I wonder if maybe the reason none of us are fishing is I wonder if, we, if any of us really know who he is. Because I would say to you this. If you could get just a glimpse of who he really is, it wouldn't be a matter of needing to inspire you to try to go fishing. It would change everything about my job. For me too. So I, I, I want to take us to the place this morning and, and even end us in this place. As a church, I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I want to ask you to join me in saying, Father, I wonder if we even really know who you are. Show us who you are so that we can understand that we need you. Because the reason I think the church doesn't grow, I mean, it's not because there's not great programs. I know there's a lot of bad preaching that goes on in a lot of places. That's not why the church didn't grow. It's not because there's not great music. I know there's great and bad music all over. That's not why the church isn't growing. The church isn't growing because the church isn't fishing. You and me are supposed to be the ones telling them about Jesus. You see, somewhere we got things so mixed up that we started thinking that the church is about, well, that's where we're supposed to see and meet Jesus. And so what I'm supposed to do as a Christian is try to convince people to come to church with me so that they can meet Jesus. You got it all backwards. No wonder the brand is, no wonder things aren't working. It was never intended to work like that. Church is supposed to be where we come together and we share our stories. Man, I was fishing last week. I thought I had this guy hooked. I was at the gas pumps. We were talking about Jesus. I thought, oh, and he snapped my line and got away. <laughs> or, man, I was at the gas pumps last night. I didn't even know I was fishing. All of a sudden, I had this guy on the line. And by the way, here he is. I led him to the Lord at the gas pump last week. And that's why he came to church with me. That's what church is supposed to be about. And it changes everything about the way it works. Because let's just be honest. The way church works right now is if you come into the room and you don't hear enough music that scratches a certain itch in you. Or the preacher doesn't preach a message that stirs you up the right way. You just might not go back next week. That's not the way it's supposed to work, man. 
It's supposed to work because there's a bunch of us that are coming together, busting our butts as we fish for men every day in life. And then we come together and we encourage each other and we talk about the good, we talk about the bad, and we celebrate our king together. That's what church is supposed to work like. That's what church is supposed to look like. So are you fishing? Are you fishing? When's the last time any of us have introduced someone to our king? Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey. You see the teaching to obey part? That's where the church comes in and and the baptism part. But the making disciples part, that's on you and me. When we're away from here. Let's, let's just pray about this. Father.